Welcome to Elders Rising. Today we have Mitch with us still. <laughs> He's alive. He ended up. Do you want to? Do you want to give an update or anything like that? Yeah, uh, I don't really think it's relevant. I don't think so either. Oh, good. <laughs> I didn't know what to say though. It's like well, you're, you're back. <laughs> Uh, Obviously, Mitch is like, like I, I have a little bit of free time after the video that I made because I ended up getting getting COVID, and so I was off work for the ten days for that, and then I ended up getting it gave me pneumonia really bad in all the chambers and both my lungs, and I got a bunch of blood clots in my lungs and in my one in my artery. So I've been off work for three weeks. So I had some spare time, so I'm here. If I have the time, I'll be here. I'm gl I, was, I, I didn't know how to say it where to be appropriate amount of offense. I almost died. Where it's like, I'm glad you're... I almost sick, died, but I'm invincible. But not? I don't know. That's what I, that's what I told Dave. I said, I'm invincible. And he says, the science is starting to back that up. You've been <laughs> shot. You've been blown up. You, all this other shit. And he says, and then the doctor tells you that you're probably going to die. And here you are. Like a week Two and a half, later. a week and a half later, just you know, just chipper and fine as can be. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we also have Miles and Ben with us today again. They're back. They're back. They didn't learn. We appreciate them. You gotta do better than that to chase us off. <laughs> <laughs> um, and today we're gonna talk specifically about. Um, we're gonna go over um, Elder Oaks's talk in this most recent com conference where he talks about. Um, defending, the title is Defending Our Divinely Inspired Constitution. And this obviously runs right along the lines with what, we, what we've been talking about the whole time is the Constitution. And so that's kind of what one, our jumping off point today is. Do we want to start with this or do we want to do anything else before we start? Mm, so I guess just start. Just start and see what happens. Yeah. We all re we all read it, read it and um, looked at it individually, but we didn't ha do any talking about it yet. So this is all going to be raw. Raw. My uh, brother used to eat raw hot dogs when he got off the bus from school. They're not actually raw, though. Then he got cancer and he died. Well, so, don't eat raw hot dogs. Fair enough. <laughs> I don't, I don't I'm think just I'm ever saying. Gonna, I don't think I'm ever going to understand how your mind works. Like, <laughs> I don't think that's... Okay. Um, he starts off by saying, um, Our belief in divine inspiration... Let's see. That's this. The, our belief in divine inspiration... Why don't we go on a line? Latter-day Saints a unique responsibility to uphold and defend the United States Constitution and principles of Constitution. Um, what did you say? So why don't we just read it in a line and then we don't have to like bounce back and forth and get in a weird order. I'm I'm fine with that. You want to start us off, Miles? Are we gonna Are we gonna read like the whole thing? I think let's. I think and then stop. Let's read it by paragraph and then kind of break it down to what what it means for us. And I don't know. All right. Okay. That's kind of that was my thought. Go ahead and start us off, Miles. In this troubled time, I have felt to speak about the inspired Constitution of the United States. This Constitution is of special importance to our members in the United States, but it is also a common heritage of Constitutions around the world. Just for a little bit of context, um, where Elder Oaks um, gave this talk was in General Conference, which is to the whole world. April 21. Yeah, April 21, so just this last April. But um, the, the audience who's, who he's talking to is not just from the United States. Um, there's more members outside of the United States than there are in the United States. And I think that it's, it's I very much liked how he, how this was a topic and a focus, because it's something that's really important. Well, as goes the U.S., so goes the rest of the world when it comes to um, if the Constitution is extinguished and freedom dies here, if freedom dies here, it dies throughout the rest of the world. Um, whether we want to admit it or want to accept the fact that the United States still leads the world, I mean, we do, through example and through, through principle. Um, so, 
you know, if, if freedom dies here, it's going to die everywhere else. And, you know, we'll, we'll lose our right to worship as, as we so choose and the gospel will disappear and a whole bunch of other tragedies and travesties will happen. The United States does do a lot of good in the world. Still. Uh, we still do, of course. And the surprising thing is, a lot of people don't know, but the United States Constitution is the oldest written and continuous constitution. So all the others that have come after have borne some resemblance. Um, our constitution was, was some of the basis of their constitutions. And so that can continue to be an inspiration to the world if we hold it up as such. But that, exactly what you said, we have to uphold it as such. And we have to continue to be that beacon of light to the rest of the world that beacon of light and truth and justice, which we are. But so it, I, it's been perverted and it's been trampled on and people don't, people in our society don't see it for, for what it is. You know, we get, we get hung up on past injustices and, and things that have happened and we say, well, how good can we be if our history is this? But it's really no different than any any history of any other country or nation in the history of the world. Everybody is guilty of injustices and abuses against their people and minorities and whatever. Everybody in the world has ancestors that were either slaves or slave owners. And in most cases, for, for everybody in the world, it's going to be both. It's just a matter of how recent... How recent it was well I think there's a point to be made there that it seems like it may have been the most recent in the US but that's not necessarily the case no <laughs> slavery is still alive. May not be the case slavery is alive and well in a lot of places in the world and it it's still alive and well in the United States as far as um, illegal immigrants go for one example a lot of them are put into you know, slave labor as part of their getting over here. And also the sex trade. The sex trade, there's a lot of sex slaves here in the United States. Um, one thing about the Constitution, too, though, is it, it in itself doesn't have power. And that's something that's, um, it's, it's just words on paper. And there's no power in that. The only thing that it has, the thing that has power is us. And if we live it, you know. It's just like the scriptures. They're just a, they're just books. They're divinely inspired, but if if it's not written in your heart, it doesn't do anything. It's just sitting on a shelf somewhere, or in a cupboard, or on a uh, in a file on, in your computer. It just doesn't do anything unless you actually live it, unless you understand it and and actually try to understand it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so we, you're you're right. We have to we have to live it. We have to strive to understand it, and just like the scriptures, our understanding and our um, our knowledge of it can only increase as we continually study and apply those principles to our individual lives and to our families. Did you move on? Let's move on. <laughs> we'll be here all day. Section one. A constitution is the foundation of government. It provides structure and limits for the exercise of government powers. The United States Constitution is the oldest written constitution still in force today. Though originally adopted by only a small number of colonies, it soon became a model worldwide. Today, every nation except three have adopted written constitutions. In these remarks, I do not speak for any political party or other group. I speak for the United States Constitution, which I have studied for more than 60 years. I speak for, from my experience as a law clerk to the Chief Justice of the United States, Supreme Court. I speak from my 15 years as a professor of law and my three and a half years as a justice on the, Supreme Court, on the Utah Supreme Court. Most importantly, I speak from 37 years as an, apostle, as an apostle of Jesus Christ, responsible to study the meaning of the divinely inspired United States Constitution, to work of, 
uh, to the work of his rest of his restored church. One of the things that I think is um, you don't see you don't see apostles do much is give their credentials because it seems like something that shouldn't matter, but it, I, I think that it's very it's it's cool to see him go through and say it's not just some dudes talking here here's the here's the experience that I've had and here's what I've done and I, and I think that that's that's something that you don't see very often especially in things like like general conference but I but I like it well and it it also applies directly to the topic mm -hmm. of, of what he was was speaking about I mean President Nelson was a heart surgeon but I mean heart surgery how often does does that have anything to do with um, you know the principles of the church or um, a direct effect on on us as a people you know um, one of the things I wanted to, to touch on was in that paragraph that I read the first one mm -hmm. um, I don't remember it's in DNC but you know Lord the Lord told Joseph Smith that the Constitution was to spread throughout the rest of the world and I mean it, it started you know like like he says all but three nations have adopted written constitutions I it's my personal belief that that's a start of it I think eventually uh, they will be improved upon until it comes to the point where we're all at a, the point of, of maximum freedom as you know individuals whether that's you know now or during the millennium I'm not one to say I don't know I would assume you know knowing the prophecies and everything that applies to you know the end of times that it comes after during the millennium but I think in its entirety and in its final perfected form it is going to spread to the rest of the nations after Christ returns that's you know kind of how what I, what I think and how I how I think that's going to happen but I mean it's it's clear that it's started already one of the things that um, I did I remember a quote from Joseph Smith where he said the and I'm, I don't I only remember bits and pieces but the main core concept of it was the um, the process of entering into the Millennium will be a gradual process Mm -hmm. and, and eventually, yes, Christ will come, but it's um, but it's a gradual lead up, and there's there's a lo lot of little things that's like our lives, our quality of our lives are becoming better. The the amount of freedom that we have, the choices that we have, are becoming better. And I think these are all all add to that gradual entrance into that state. I mean, we're already in the process of the second coming. Where are we? Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> I guess when we start seeing resurrected family members, we'll know how close <laughs> how close we are yeah. for those that are going to be resurrected before he comes to help usher them in, or when people are called back to Missouri. Anyway, sorry. Moving on. <laughs> the United States Constitution is unique because God revealed that He established it for the rights and protections of all flesh. That's in DNC 101 verse 77 and also verse 80. That is why this constitution is of special concern for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints throughout the world. Whether or how its principles should be applied in other nations of the world is for them to decide. What was God's purpose in establishing the United States Constitution? We see it in the doctrine of moral agency. In the first decade of the restored church, its members on the western frontier were suffering private and public persecution. Partly, this was because of their opposition to the human slavery then existing in the United States. In these unfortunate circumstances, God revealed through the, prof through the prophet Joseph Smith eternal truths about his doctrine. God has given his children moral agency, the power to to decide and to act. The most desirable condition for, this, for the exercise of that agency is maximum freedom for men and women to act according 
to their individual choices. Then, the Revelation explains, every man may be accountable for his own sins in the day of judgment. DNC 101.78 Therefore, the Lord revealed, it is not right that any man should be in bondage one to another. DNC 101.79 This obviously means that human slavery is wrong. And according to the same principle, it is wrong for citizens to have no voice in the selection of, the ru of their rulers or the making of their laws. We actually, so we kind of talked about this right before we started um, talking about uh, rulers. Um, that, that's not the case here. In the United States, we don't have rulers, we don't have leaders, we have elected representatives. But throughout the rest of the world, um, that that statement does apply. In I think in most most places, I could be wrong. I'm not real familiar with other people's <laughs> um, foundations of government. So, I think it's interesting that we're here in this first section that he talked about. And the first thing he says in his answer to why it was established is the doctrine of moral agency. So, if you haven't noticed yet, that's my thing. Everything goes back to agency. Pretty much every time I talk about anything that's related to this, it goes back to agency. But at somewhere in the middle of there, it says, Every man may be accountable for his own sins in the day of judgment. So to me... Like, that's what you get for agency is you, it's on you. And you can choose the right or you can not choose the right, but it's on you. It's not someone else's responsibility. Well, and if you don't have the freedom of choice, then you don't, you know, you don't have agency. If you can't choose, then doing something that's right isn't actually right. Well, you know, whole, whole war in heaven thing that idea yeah. well and that's just the thing if you're forced to make the right decision you're not actually making the right decision. you're not making a decision you're just being yeah. forced to do something yeah. which is so not that, right regardless of what that thing is and the thing is and that's why individual liberty is so important because you know it gives you that right and that opportunity to choose for yourself based off of the personal re revelation the thing that I think is so interesting about this is like when you look at the this this life and why we actually live here. It's like why 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 God created this this experience for us. And it's for us to to grow and it's for us to become better. It's for us to he he wants us to grow up and be like him. It's for us to exercise our agency to do those things. That's that's the thing. Is we the whole purpose is so that we can learn how to make good choices. So we can learn how to choose good things because that's what he does that's the the it's my belief that the reason the elements obey god is because he chooses perfectly and they know if he says it it is and so it's like it's it's not it's not a reaction to his act his act is what it is and it's it's because that's because of who he is and he wants us to be he wants us to be what he is. He wants us to grow up and be like him, like any father wants the best of his children. And it's it's so it's so interesting how the the agency is the that that crux, that that or like that point that's so important to everything. Because that's that's the reason why we're here. Because we with agency we're going to screw up. We're going to make bad choices. That's just part of it. But without it we, we can't have the experience you can learn academically what the right thing and the wrong thing is but unless you actually have to go out and do the right thing and the wrong thing it doesn't mean anything to you well yeah and it was I mean it it was important enough to God to allow a war in heaven to happen over it and it was important enough that he was going to let us come down here and fail and therefore the need to provide a savior arose so that's everything back to agency. To go kind of off on a on the side a little bit. Um, you know, I've I've spent a lot of time in the last few months 
learning about the Savior and learning about the Atonement and everything. And, you know, the, the entire premise of us coming is agency, making choices, learning to be obedient, and admitting our faults so that we can be more like Him. And, I mean, the, the, beauty, the beauty of the Atonement is, you know, there's nothing that we can do personally. We have to say, you know, when we screw up, we have to say, I'm sorry. And in some instances, like mine, where I'm so emotionally numb, I had, I had to ask to feel the way that I needed to feel, which it was granted. <laughs> I felt how I needed to feel. Um, and, you know, I, I, I went through the process and you know, for the first, really for the first time in my life, applied the atonement to myself, and the fact that the only other way that we're saved is through grace, I mean, you know, we don't just accept Christ, we have to try to become like Him, we have to get to know Him, and we're not just saved through grace, we're also changed through grace to be saved. Uh, I mean, you know, it, it was such a powerful experience for me um, just because of how arrogant and ignorant I've been for since I came home from from Iraq. And, you know, it's there's no words to explain it other than it's just, it's beautiful. We're saved solely through His grace and His love. And there's nothing else that we can do other than try our best. And that's sufficient. And in this life as mortals, we're never going to... I don't think we're ever going to appreciate it as much as we should. Because I don't think we're capable as mortals to appreciate the atonement as we should. Makes me think of the... You know, the only thing that was asked of us is that broken heart and contrite spirit. Mm-hmm. And it's like, we think of, oh, you have to do so much or give up so much or do, and it's like, you just have to try and, and feel bad for what you've done and, and keep trying and don't give up. And like there, you said, it's beautiful. There's an amazing talk by, oh, what's his name? I can't think of his name right now, but it was His Grace is Sufficient. It was a talk delivered at BYU it's on YouTube and it's it's great and one of the things that he says in there sorry for the side tangent <laughs> but one of the things he says in there is he's talking to uh, a teenage a teenager and he asked her he said he drew two line or two dots on a paper one at the top which was Christ and one at the bottom which was her and says you know draw a line at where we have to meet him and so she was about to draw a line in the middle then went down and marked it, you know, pretty far at the bottom. And he said, you're wrong. And she says, I knew it had to be up higher. I knew it had, you know, we, we have to meet him so far. And he says, no, there is no line. There is no line at which we have to meet to be saved. And it was, it's a really good talk. It's really powerful. You should look it up. Um, if you just type up. Type in on YouTube, His Grace is Sufficient. It'll take you right there. It's the top result. But it's it's amazing. I just wanted to note, it's clear that God, you know, one of God's most basic and long-standing principles is this principle of moral agency. All the way back to the pre-mortal life where there was a war in heaven over it, as we've talked about. Um, in the scriptures, it's also discussed multiple times in regards to political philosophies of what God would, would prefer. He would prefer people be able to elect and provide a government where people have maximum agency. Um, <clears throat> talked about it to Samuel when the Jews wanted a king. They saw the nations around them had kings, they wanted a king to be their leader, right? In the Book of Mormon, around the time of Benjamin and Mosiah, there had been kings. They're about to appoint some judges, right? And there's a discussion of why have a king versus a judge. Um, I think it also ties into 
uh, Joseph Smith's response once to a question about how, how do your people, how do you keep them in order? How is their order maintained in the church? It's by teaching basic principles and letting people choose from themselves. People have their own moral agency. So if our, if our rights within our governmental system provide that basic underlying principle of moral agency, then that is where we need to be as a basis. Um, and our rights only end where they start to infringe upon others, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that ties in perfectly with what the Savior taught as the two great commandments. If you're violating God or violating your fellow men, then that's the edge of your rights. But up until that point, you have your rights to, to act and, and behave as you would. Is it you or the next? I don't remember. It was you. Next to me. And our belief? Yep. Section 2. Section 2. Our belief that the United States Constitution was divinely inspired does not mean that divine revelation dictated every word dictated every word and phrase, such as the provisions allocating the number of representatives from each state or the, or the minimum age of each. The Constitution was not a fully grown document, said President J. Reuben Clark. On the contrary, he explained, we, we believe it must grow and develop to meet the changing needs of an advancing world. For example, inspired amendments abolished slavery and gave women the right to vote. However, we do not see inspiration in every Supreme Court decision interpreting the Constitution. Um, I want to touch on that for just a second. Um, so it, we acknowledge that it's not a fully, fully grown document, um, and, and we know that. Um, such as with the three-fifths compromise, um, obviously not inspired. But then again, just like everything else in this mortal realm that we know and understand, is written and received by man who has fallen. We're not always going to get everything right, but, and we've touched on the three-fifths compromise, for example, um, but another example of not everything being inspired would be like the 16th amendment which uh, establishes um, like the IRS and the, the current tax code and stuff like that that flies in the face of article 1 section 9 stating how taxation should be carried out and represented so just like anything else it can be perverted by man just like I'm sure uh, you know part of the Old and New Testament, as it's been translated throughout the centuries, has been, in a way, defiled from original intents and meanings. Um, just because that's the nature of man, as things are written and retranslated over centuries. One of the things that I really, um, it's, the, the principle is taught in um, the scriptures, line upon line, precept upon precept. In in the it's it's so true across multiple domains though. I think of like software and the stuff that we, one of the the design principles that we follow is called an iterative design. You make something that works a little bit and you you improve it little by little, <laughs> and you it, you get something done and then you come back and do it a little better and you do a, add something else and add something else. It's iterative and that's 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 a I think that that's an eternal principle of. <laughs> grow little by little even Christ in Doctrine and Covenants it talks about him growing grace for grace as he as he was here on earth and I think that it's the same thing in this in this context as well as like the the Constitution it's meant to be for us but the principles around b behind it and, and he go I love how he goes in later into these principles but those principles are the things that we have to understand and if we don't if we don't know the principles of them then the iteration is going to be a, a step back instead of a step forward just like life, when you make bad choices, you, you sin and stuff, it's a step back instead of a step forward. It's just like, that's part of life, is it's growing pains. Mm -hmm. but, but on that, you know, that step back from when you sin, when you, when you apply the atonement to yourself, you're so much farther ahead than you would have been had you not made that mistake. 
there's a reason why we make mistakes. There's a reason why we learn and grow. The, our mistakes help us help us to propel farther than we could having not been able to make those mistakes or having not made those mistakes because going through that process ultimately when we're trying to learn something we try to absorb as much knowledge as we can about it and so you know through through the atonement we learn more about the atonement and so our 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 knowledge and our understanding and our appreciation surges so much more than it would be had had we not gone through that process so sin yeah sin is sinning is bad but on the flip side of it once you once you've made amends there there's it's not there's there's no words to describe it and i don't think you can understand until you have personally applied the atonement in your life so in there it says that everything is not inspired and i think that elder oaks gave another talk i've been looking for it for a long time and i've not been able to find it where he basically says that we have been given intelligence so that we can make decisions and sometimes a decision does not need an inspired answer sometimes you know a decision is not going to have a great effect and it's up to you what you what you can choose you know and sometimes that's career related related sometimes it's other things just make a choice either one's wrong but do do what you're what you want to do and um so you don't have to have ins inspiration and in making choices about certain things in your lives and sometimes there's multiple right answers that are you know they're your salvation doesn't depend on that that's and so, things. yeah it doesn't and i his, i think it was elder oaks i don't know if it was for sure i've been looking for that talk for a long time but i'd really like to find it there's a scripture there's two two chapters in the doctrine and covenants sections but um, there, are, I don't remember. I want to say like 25. Uh, I don't remember. I'm gonna. I don't remember the sections. They're real short ones. They're ones that are directly two people, and the the both of them are almost identical. They're two two two, two different people, if I remember right. But um, he says, and they're real short. But it says something effective like they're getting called on a mission, and it's like you can go north, you can go south, you can go east, you can go west. To me, it matters not. And this is like Christ speaking. They're like to me, it matters not. And it's just just go. And it's like that it's true in our lives too like sometimes we get really caught up on like what do i need to do and like you're you're you search and you try and find and sometimes it's just go just go do something you just know? keep moving just keep going yeah um the last thing that i i want to touch on about this um you know he says we do not see inspiration in every supreme court decision interpreting the constitution we've talked about this several times I've, I've, on our Facebook page, I've put quotes from the founders on there, and these quotes are harder to find than a lot of the other quotes from the founders about, about the courts, but they warned us about letting the courts be the end-all, be-all for the interpretation of the law, because for the, in, for the most part, you know, what makes, what is going to make the people more free, and what is going to restrict the people, because, we're supposed to board, we're supposed to be on the side of what leads to more individual liberty and the courts get that wrong a lot because once again it's made up of of men we're fallen and your personal opinions and beliefs are going to dictate you know um, in this case rulings that you'll make and so it's just once again more more fuel to the fire of the courts aren't the end all be all but it all just boils boils down to you're only as free as you choose to be all right i believe the united states constitution contains at least five divinely inspired principles first is the principle that the source of government power is the people in a time when sovereign power was universally assumed to come from divine right of kings or, mili or from military power, attributing sovereign power to the people was revolutionary. Philosophers had advocated this, but the United States Constitution 
was the first to apply it. Sovereign power in the people does not mean that mobs or other groups of people can intervene to intimidate or force government action. The Constitution established a constitutional democratic republic where the people exercise their power through their elected representatives. I love that. We're seeing a lot of that. BLM, Antifa, um, the abortion crowd. Mobs or other groups. And we're seeing a lot of mobs right now. That principle, though, that core principle, the government gets its power from, by, from the people. The source of the government power is the people. That right there is, is so powerful. It's so... Because a lot of times, a lot of times you, you talk to people and, and they, they view the government as this big entity that has power over what they do. And no, it's not. The government is what we allow to happen. We give the government its power. And because of us, the government has power. And it's just like, it's a mindset that we've slowly gotten away from as a, as a culture. But, but it's, it, that's, that's one of the reasons why I think there's so much strife right now, is because people don't realize the power comes from us. We, we allow it. We forge our own destiny. If people want change, they need to be the change they want. You know, a lot of politicians, we would say, are probably influenced by money or, or by uh, lobbying, right? And, and things that we probably wouldn't agree with. So if you want a government that's not full of that, you need to elect people and people need to stand up to be elected that, that can stand for rights and principles and not corruption. It goes back to electing statesmen over politicians. Those who are going to put the the welfare of, you know, um, the people, their their constituents, over, you know, their own power and ambition, but they don't do that anymore. I mean, even look at uh, Mike Lee. You know, he did a good job for a few years, but I feel like he got bought out four years ago. You know, and another thing that we had talked about before we started filming was. You know, I think a lot, a lot of the problems that we're facing now, with government overreach and the bureaucracy and just the vastness. This is the largest government the world's ever seen, and it shouldn't be. But I think that goes back to, at least the greatest generation. You know, the generation that fought World War II and the subsequent generations, um, because you know, back then with FDR and everything, um, and it may go back you know to the great depression where everything was so bad that they started just throwing everything in the hands of the government to take care of and so they became very tr um, trusting of the government to take care of more problems so that these aren't things that we have to worry about in our daily lives and it's just spiraled out of control until we are at the point where we're at now and I would argue that we're seeing a republic in its death throes um, so you know it was all you, you don't question the government you trust you don't question the status quo and you just let government do what government's gonna do until we've gotten to the point where we are now that it's just it's out of control and it's almost in every aspect of our life I mean like I said you're, you're only as free as you choose to be but at the same time there, there's consequences I mean, look at what old uh, Creepy Joe said well, this was last week. The choice is now va ma vaxxed or masked. It's your choice. Okay, well, for one, who's going to make me? Are you going to come all the way out to Podunk, Utah to try and force me? Now, who are you going to send? Because you ain't going to do it. So the government still isn't thankfully isn't massive enough to come and enforce that on the individual level even with like the the mandates that they were doing the uh, executive what do they call it executive orders or whatever here in utah with like with uh, thanksgiving and stuff where it's like Douche oh you bags. can't have can't have people you know they're just saying <laughs> stuff and and expect people to yeah obey. it's like hey do you think do you think they'll listen you know it's like hey two masks are better than one and three masks is better than two you wear left shoes but you have to wear them on both feet it's like Who's going to listen, you know? Well, a lot of people. That, 
that's that's, that's us. That's what I'm saying. Part, <laughs> that's that's, that's that, that mindset. That's that mindset. The government has the power that we give it. We all have to get back to the point of uh, no, I'm not going to do that. That's the dumbest shit that I've ever heard. I'm not going to do that. Mm-hmm. And make me. I think that goes back to I. I don't remember if you guys talked about it on a podcast. We talked about it while I was on the last one that I did or somewhere else but like you I mean just say no but they that power is from people being obedient it's and the more people see the less people trust the government like I mean this year is proof of that in both directions that some people will just blindly go along with it which is horrifying to me and then there's also a group of people that are just like you know what nope (laughs) but being able to stand on those principles this is what i was getting at with you guys have talked before but being able to stand for principles stand for what is right and be able to defend those principles not just be you know a blatant dickhead about it whoa hey so hey, it feels like we're, a get, personal attack we're here. getting personal here. <laughs> so ass, you you've got to be able to to stand behind your belief and not just be like no, and not not be able to iterate, um, why. iterate why or explain why this is wrong. It was in talking about uh, like sitting in Sunday school and being able to say no. We believe X, Y, and Z. This is why. Instead of being worried about offending someone. Well, that's, that's another thing that we've talked about is, you know, I don't really have power to offend you. No. I control what I say, but you taking offense to that is your own personal choice. Yeah. And if you let somebody offend you, you're giving them power over you. Yeah, Elder Bednar had a conference talk about choosing not to be offended. That was a good one. It was. That was a good one. Awesome. That is one of my favorite conference conference talks. <laughs> Choose not to be offended. That's on you. Yeah. But like like anyway. you, like you said, um, you know, it's it's not just saying no and then being belligerent about it. It's being able to back it up and say this is why this is wrong. Um, it's like. Uh, you know, there's there's members of my family, both on my side and my wife's side, that through this whole COVID thing have been like, we need to wear masks, we need all need to do our part, blah, blah, blah. And I, I got asked after I got out of the hospital, well, have you changed your mind on anything? No. Nope. I am stubborn and I am dumb. But the, the principles remain. Yeah, I happen to be one of those people who got the side effects and got super sick. But that doesn't change the fact that mask mandates are wrong. That doesn't change the fact that trying to force people to get a vaccine is wrong. Well, those are those were... are eternal truth and principle. Well, if those things were right, they wouldn't require mandates. Well, that's just the thing. they would sell themselves. Exactly. That's what they I've would been saying. stand on their own merits. That's what I've been saying about the vaccine. Of being this correct. Time. If your vaccine was the wonder cure that you say it is, it would sell itself on its own merits. This entire pandemic would have sold itself on its own merits, but it hasn't. If you've done your own research, if you've looked at it with an open mind and seriously contemplated it, instead of just taking people at their word, which you should never really do, then this whole thing would have sold itself. And it would make sense, but it hasn't. I think it's also nuts. This is just me, but... I think it's also nuts the we don't, we don't talk you don't talk about it much but it's like the vaccine organizations they um, they've made it legally impossible for redress mm-hmm. like you can't you can't there's no legal they've, they've they're not only do they not stand on its own but they've made sure the government makes sure that they can't get hurt from their from it either and it's just like yeah. that's that's something where it's like that's Yet on the flip when, side, when, when when I go to a, a, a 
water slide park or I go to a park or something with my kids and I have to sign a waiver. It's like, okay, I know I, if my kid gets hurt, uh, they're getting themselves hurt. Mm -hmm. so but at the same time, you could still turn around and sue them. It happens all the time. And on the flip side of that argument, they want to allow you to be able to sue um, gun manufacturers if somebody uses their, their product in a crime. So, I mean, what is it? Which, which one is it going to be? Well, that's why we don't want to know principles. We want to get muddied up with details. <laughs> well, and if you, if you go back to the, to the whole vaccine schedule for kids... Um, you get back to about 1960 or so, give or take 10 years, and all of the recommended time frames for those come from the manufacturers. The CDC takes the manufacturer's rec recommendation and just regurgitates it to the public. So if you, if you want to go look at that, and then you can go look at some other numbers if anybody wants to, but it's obvious to me that those numbers have or those recommendations have not been established based on eff efficacy of the vaccines but more based around the bottom line and money aspect of when vaccine manufacturers can get paid for you getting their product because every business wants everybody to have their product and to pay for it and there's no difference there there's a lot of money in the pharmaceutical pharmaceutical arena and the vaccine arena you know but i, I there, there's a lot of vaccines that i can get behind polio measles measles Smallpox. diphtheria <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I really don't want yeah there's a lot of things that i can get behind but recently that will kill you with, yeah but with, with this i have a real problem getting a vaccine when the big money the big donors and the big pushers behind it are all eugenicists thanks bill uh, I have a real hard time getting behind that, my opinion. If you want to get the vaccine, that's cool. I don't care. I mean, that's your thing. I'm not going to look down on you for it. But I expect the same respect in return for my choice not to. The short-term numbers, from what I've seen, look pretty good as far as how what the vaccine's doing. And certainly long-term, hopefully there aren't issues. Look up the number of vaccine-related deaths, how many are reported, and all of that stuff. You may readjust that after you go find those numbers. I, anyway. I certainly haven't read everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, not, that, that's for another time, I think. <laughs> on top of that, how many were ruled as due to the vaccine, and then the coroners later changed it to not well, because of the vaccine. There's what been I, a what few I was, thousand. What I was referencing is there's a reporting hotline for vaccine reactions, and they have tracked, they have an estimated number of how many deaths occurred mm -hmm. due to vaccines over since, like, 1978 or something when it was started. I don't remember the exact time frame. And they, they figure they had approximately 1% actually get reported due to the way the reporting happens. And then... There's been a certain number since that, on like a 20-year basis, and then since COVID began, they've had that 20-year number in like four months. So, anyway, well, people can go find those numbers and and decide for themselves. But I'd be happy to look into it. Yeah, <laughs> that's a that's an interesting subject. This is the last thing that I'm going to add in before we move in move on if somebody else wants to add in whatever um but a month into the vaccine when it was starting to become available within the first month there was at least 900 and was it 22 9 922 or 944 deaths reported within the first month that lines out with the numbers i saw and i don't i, I don't talking about i don't know where it's at now but i mean it's it, it's a virus you don't viruses are just a thing that you can't really fight until you get it from what i understand about viruses i mean i'm not a virologist no but those that have studied it for the last 40 years would say that until about a year ago <laughs> now we got a magic cure anyway sorry anyway anybody the, else the, the thing that i think it, it really comes down to though is we're, we as a society have been open to the fact that our institutions are not infallible. 
and that's that's really where what it comes down to is is our institutions the things that the things that we held up as being the the authorities on different information the authorities on different decisions those institutions we have had cause to look under them with scrutiny we've had cause to look under them look look at them with uh with doubt and distrust d dubious eyes exactly and it's it's natural when when there's when you have a bad actor you start paying attention more and that's what the stage we're in whether that's through vaccines whether it's through the finances and through taxes through so many of our different institutions have shown themselves to be bad actors mm -hmm. and atf and fbi people cia are, yeah people are flag laws. va <laughs> hitler's ss oh that's the school district my bad Okay, moving on. Uh, a second principle, or inspired. Me? Yep. A second inspired principle is the division of delegated power between the nation and its subsidiary states. In our federal system, this unprecedented principle has sometimes been altered by inspired amendments, such as those abolishing slavery and extending voting rights to women, mentioned earlier. Significantly, the United States Constitution limits the national government to, to the exercise of powers granted expressly or by implication, and it reserves all government powers to the states respectively or to the people. That's from the Tenth Amendment. That is this from the Tenth Amendment, and it's very important. There is so much in this paragraph. This is a perfect example of how the states respectively have let us down as citizens of the United States. The, the states, I mean, especially look, look at here in Utah, our, our previous governor and our current governor, they're willing to sell us down the road and our rights and what the majority of people in Utah believe for federal funding. And Herbert and Cox, what they either don't seem to understand or they don't care is Salt Lake City Park City and Moab don't speak for the rest of us. Once you get outside of the cities, Utah's probably the most conservative place you're going to find. Um, have you seen what Idaho's been doing lately? <laughs> yeah, Idaho lines up better with my I, moral Idaho, principles than what Utah does. Been, I like what's going on in Idaho I do right too. Now. Idaho and Wyoming. Idaho and Wyoming okay. are better at being Utah than Utah is. And, and Utah, should be, Utah should be the beacon. We should be the beacon to the rest of the country because of the things that the majority of the people here believe. But for some reason, our representatives only want to listen to the people in Park City and Salt Lake. It's because that's where all the tax revenue money comes from, from all the, all the sales tax. They can shove it up their butts. You're not wrong. But I think Idaho has set a recent example of asserting its state's rights to the federal government in its recent um, legislation on the ATF and well, a lot of gun things. laws and other things. What did they do? Idaho, they Idaho basically... Busy. The, the, <laughs> the, the short answer, the short explanation is they told every police officer in Idaho that you will be prosecuted as a criminal if you assist in federal constitutional gun right violations. Well, wow. Utah also passed a similar law. It, um, it makes it so local law enforcement um, it's either can't or doesn't have to um, assist like the ATF. Um, so Utah has done that too, and um, was it yesterday? Sometime this week there was a special session, and they were wanting to ban the critical race theory and create Utah as a Second Amendment sanctuary the state. All the Democrats walked out, yeah. and they voted anyway. And in my opinion, if you walk out of session, you forfeit your office. In my opinion. You want to walk out, you want to be a little bitch, bye. You, we don't have any use for you. You just forfeited your office because you're a coward. You want to throw a little four-year-old fit as a grown-ass adult. Um, you should lose your you should lose your seat. Well, if I'm not mistaken, they voted anyway because there's a supermajority in Utah, and they passed it without them. They said, "Okay, you don't want to play. We're doing it anyway." Um, Cox 
didn't vote on it or didn't... Did he veto it or something? I, I, I'm not exactly sure what he did, but he basically didn't let it happen because there's like $1.6 trillion of COVID funding coming. And if they allowed these things to pass, then we wouldn't get it. Well, there's only like a million people in Utah, so where's my cut? So, yeah. So Cox, living up to his name, (laughs) is being a royal cock. He's worried about money. He's selling us and what we believe because the majority of the state wants to be a Second Amendment sanctuary because we don't want the feds to come in and say, you can't have 30-round magazines, you can't have ARs. We don't want that. They might in Salt Lake City and Park City, but the rest of us don't want it. And this is a perfect example of them just going and doing what they want. They're thinking about dollar signs like a teenage boy thinks with his wiener. I'm not wrong. <laughs> that is the best analogy I can come up with. Is it appropriate? No. Do I care? Not really. And I'll say it to Spencer's face, and I'll say it to any of our other uh, legislators who think that way. You're thinking with your wiener. Like a teenager. Good job. Way to evolve, dipshit. I hate him. <laughs> I think that the um, Supreme Court took up uh, just this last week, didn't they take up something on the... Um about, about what was it warrantless seizures? Uh, yeah, Fourth Amendment slash Second Amendment. Um, unanimous unanimous decision from the Supreme Court that um, what do they call the clause where police officers can basically act in an exigent exigent circumstances? Yeah. So basically, um, there was a case where a guy was arguing with his wife, put an unloaded gun on the table, said, "Just shoot me now and get it over with." Um, he got institutionalized for a while, they searched the home without a warrant, told his wife that he had agreed to it, took his guns on a red flag law, and he now just got a unanimous decision out of the Supreme Court in his favor that the police were wrong in warrantlessly searching his home. The same should apply to to the no-knock warrants. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that set a precedent that will favor that. I understand the premise behind no-knock warrants. Because as a former door kicker, you don't want a high, a high threat to know you're coming. But this isn't the streets of Iraq. This is the United States. And if you're on the up and up with your SWAT team and everything like that, I mean, you should have the person outgunned anyway, so why do you need to not knock? You know the risks of the job when you sign up for it. Whoa. Easy there, Hot Rod. I'm just saying, you know the risks. You mean to tell me that I, I'm, I can, I have to, like, be okay with maybe getting shot at if I sign up to be a SWAT member? Mm-hmm. The voluntary or, part of the police force? Or join the military. I don't know. You join the military, you're, there's a good chance you're going to get deployed. Well, I, don't, I shouldn't say there's a good chance. But there's you're a chance to get that you're going to get deployed. And there's a chance you could end up in a really gnarly gunfight and get shot in the throat. Yeah. Same with being a cop. You know you know the risks when you sign up. No-knock warrants are... And let's face it, do the cops always kick in the right door? <laughs> I think we have several examples of that in the last 24 months exactly. where people died because someone kicked in the wrong door and they, I don't know, were defending their house against their door getting kicked in and last little tidbit of information for me if the atf ever shows up at your door here in utah just call your local sheriff if you live in one of the freer counties just say hey the atf's here i haven't done anything wrong would you please get them out of here because i i i'm in a difficult position with law enforcement (laughs) i i i'm a law-abiding citizen and i understand i can understand where they're coming from and I you know for the most part I appreciate what our local law enforcement agencies do such as um, you know our our lo- our municipal police department where I live and our county I, I support them they're good honest you know agencies and they do the right thing most of the time like everything else man but for the most part I, I can get behind our local agencies where I draw the line is at UHP The bigger the agency, the more corrupt it gets. 
So, I support the smaller local departments who do the right If you look at municipal departments in certain central parts of the state, they have one of the worst national track records on handling situations. <laughs> Just, yeah. So just I, by the numbers, and that's and that's and that's why I I'm stuck in a hard spot with law enforcement. Do I want to have law enforcement around? Yeah, you know, to a certain extent they do keep the peace. To a certain extent, yeah. I wish that we were more moral society, so we didn't need so much of them. I but I mean, it's it's just one of those things where you're caught between the rock and the hard place, so to speak. Well, I I would. In my opinion, more things should be left to be settled person to person. Absolutely. And less government to person. But that also means you need a more moral society and we don't have it. things get things get muddied no matter how you settle it, but one of the things getting back to this principle though, the principle is that there should be a division between the so it references the states okay. and the federal. Yes. But there should be a division between government. Mm -hmm. I think that one of the benefits of that division is it, it gives space for personal accountability. When you know the people who, like, that's why it's so much easier to get behind your local, your local law enforcement. Because they're people that you can see and you know. Mm -hmm. Well, but and you guys have your, your county sheriff, your county sheriff's department, really good too. One of the things that um, municipally is not great. Yeah. One of the things, one of the things that um, that I noticed they do. It, it seems to me like, and I don't know, I, I I don't know. There's plenty that I don't see, but for what it seems like, one of the first things they do when they um, when they bring the national guard in from whether it's an emergency, whether it's an unrest or something, they take them from their 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 state and they move them to another state. Because then they're not fighting for their homes. Then they're not fighting the people. Then, then there's they're no, not there's against no their neighbors. Yeah, there's no question of loyalty because they're just they're out on a job doing a task, and that's 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 a way to subvert this principle. Well, Mitch, how does it work when uh, a exterior force comes in and the local force uh, is fighting for their homes and the exterior force is doing their job? We've been fighting dudes in Afghanistan with flip-flops and no teeth who can't read with 60-year-old AKs for 20 years. But the other flip side of that is the politicians are trying to run a war, not letting the generals do it. But, I mean... Vietnam's the gotta, other example of that. that. If you're going to fight a war, you got to let the guys take the gloves off to fight the war, or else you'll never win. The United States could still win in Afghanistan. We could have, uh, we could have, you know. I hate to say, I hate to say, win or lose because I mean, nobody wins. Because we just leave. We never finish it. We just, just like Vietnam and Korea, we just leave. So it's not a win and it's not a, lo a loss. It's just we just left. But I mean, we could have totally decimated the insurgency in Iraq. They could totally decimate the Taliban in Afghanistan, and we could have been out of both these places, I don't know, a decade ago, easy? I don't know, a few trillion dollars ago, for sure. Yeah, if you'd let the guys fight the war. But look at the military now. And I've actually, in the last few months, I've had to come to the conclusion that the military, we're not necessarily the good guys, especially the United States Army. I would say that the United States Army has abused the United States citizens as much as they have helped them and defended them. Look at the, Amer the, the situation with the American Indians. American citizens. Oh. What'd they do to them? They give them smallpox blankets. They shoot a whole bunch of people at Wounded Knee. They, all sorts of terrible shit to the Indians. I Look what the Union Army did in the South. And for the next 30 years, mm -hmm. acting as a police force, in the southern states and in the northern states, accosting people, giving them all sorts of hell. And then look at, more recently, Hurricane Katrina. The National Guard goes in and they confiscate people's guns. Yeah. I, the United States Army is not the good guys. I, I mean, I wasn't in the Army. I went and did other things that I have my own moral issues with, and that's mine to deal with. But I, the day that I had to accept that... While there have been good things done around the world, I question, I don't know, 
but I question if those good things outweigh the rest of what's been done. I agree with you. It, it, see, for people like you and I, and the majority of people who who have been in, I mean, and granted, it's it's in phases. Mm-hmm. I think for the majority of like our generation. It was getting in to do the right thing to help people, to help spread the cause of liberty, to preserve and protect our way of life here. And so our... And at some point you had to face up that you maybe were not doing that with what you had to do, but the other option was a less than honorable discharge, a court-martial, a UCMJ punishment. That was hard. The thing that stands now is the army today is not the army that I was in. And I'm going to catch a lot of flack from a lot of people because I said the same thing on Facebook today about the Army's not the good guys. Really not. And their whole, I mean, while the rest of the world is still preparing to deploy and defeat their enemies, we're worried about LG whatever. Uh, We're worried about being woke and politically correct in the military. It's not the military's job. Military's job is to be prepared to deploy anywhere in the world to defeat our enemies. Well, if I remember the last election cycle quote from Mr. Huckabee, the military's job is to kill people and break things. Yeah. (laughs) Yep. It's not to be political, social justice warriors, but there's a point to doing it. They're trying to purge all the people who are liberty-minded, who honor their oath, they're trying to purge all those people out, and they're trying to get their new age in so that they can give orders and they'll be use, followed. Use them followed. against us again. I think the same thing's happening to the police as well. That My, my theory on the defund the police is just like, I, just like I was saying earlier with your local municipalities. If they're good, honest agencies, they're not going to enforce the mass mandates. They're not going to do, they're not going to enforce the stuff that's blatantly unconstitutional. And so the federal government has no way to, you know, uh, uniformly enforce their rules. Well, that, like, That's why they keep talking about federal police forces. You do away with them, then they're just going to blindly follow orders, and then they can enforce and enact whatever they want. Also, the numbers behind, so I think it's something on the order of, like, one police officer per thousand residents is, like, their, their number they try to maintain. And so... Even if they did come in with federal, like, a thousand people blatantly ignoring one officer or two officers is... goes back. The people have the power. We just have to... One. We just have to realize that. You just... People have to be willing to, to say no. But luckily, thankfully, more and more people are waking up to what's actually going on. Because we have to. And ultimately, it's still a small minority of people waking up and seeing what's going on because maybe it's growing. It's and the more there are, the faster it'll grow. Mm-hmm. And the more that we spread stuff like this, the more it helps, I think, wake people up. But, I mean, that's just, just the thing. Like, we have, we have to help awaken people to our awful state because we're truly in an awful state. Like I said, a republic in its death throes. I don't think we're in an awful state yet. Maybe. That's because you're an optimist and you disgust me when you're being optimistic. Well, it's Fred has not be, been soured yet. Be a realist. There's, there's a lot of good things going on. Yeah? I was thinking about it, and this is something that I was thinking about the other day in Sacramento. I was thinking about the process of the, the Christ being crucified, right? Mm-hmm. And then I was thinking about the crucifixion as a tool that a government uses to keep its citizenry in check. If you don't, if you don't stay in line, this is what's going to happen to you. Here's a vivid example. This is someone that we've tortured. You don't see that here. That's true. You don't see that here. Yep. What the are the consequences for us standing up and doing what's right? Our people are going to be disappointed. Okay. It's fine. Maybe. Yeah, but at the same time, I don't know that our society will get to that point where the government's crucifying people. Because our society is so diverse 
and like we've said before, it's fractured, our society is going to collapse in upon itself before we get to that point. And the other thing is they'll do it differently. They'll just cut off your money supply. Look at they'll the, freeze your bank account. Look at the inflation that's, that's coming. That's, this, that's the same thing. Well, we're getting back they take away here. everything, all, all of your ability to live. We're going to get hit pretty hard with inflation fast. Pretty soon we're going to get hard, hit hard with inflation, and I'll be surprised if it doesn't take the dollar down with it. But I, I mean, my wife and I have been talking, and I said, you know, honestly, I think with our society being as fractured and as fragile as it is, I think the next time the economy goes down, I think our society goes with it. Can't keep us down. You're such an idiot. <laughs> Should we move on? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead and read me. Another inspired principle is the separation of powers. Well over a century before our 1787 Constitutional Convention, the English Parliament pioneered the separation of legislative and executive authority when they wrested certain powers from the king. The inspiration in the American Convention was to delegate independent executive legislative and judicial powers so these three branches could exercise checks upon one another that's it's interesting that they um they broke those into two different principles because they're both the core thing is the same is separating who does power one is for states right versus federal rights and one is for the legislative versus executive who writes the laws versus who executes on the laws or who you know and, and but the, the concept is the same, that principle is the same, is don't put all the power in one person. And again, that's diver like sharing that responsibility. And I think the reason for that is because it gives more opportunity for the people to be responsible. Because you, you have more sway over, or you have more, you can be more invested. It also allows, uh, uh, or it also forces more transparency mm -hmm. so that you can't be just off doing your thing with nobody paying attention. It makes someone pay attention and make sure people are doing the things they're supposed to be doing. Yeah, the problem is Or now, it's supposed to. The problem is now at the state and the federal level is all three branches are just trying to consolidate their own pow power one for another. Well, that's why you get like the executive with all these alphabet agencies mm -hmm. that create the, the... They don't create... The, what are they? They're not laws, they're... Well, they're the rules that they're, they're going to, the which are open for comment right now in certain aspects, and I don't know. That's a whole nother. But it's but the it, ATF's it's, it's trying to make law those, again. It's a yeah. blending of those two pr responsibilities. Those two. It's it's, yeah. it's 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 a perversion of that that principle. I do believe that if a federal alphabet agency does start a civil war with the people, it'll be the ATF. It'll be over someone's dog too. Dogs. They did it in Waco. You see the ATF? Uh, yeah, they want to appoint David Chipman, one of the agents on the ground at Waco, as the head of the division. Good job, Joe, you freaking idiot. Yeah, that ain't gonna we happen. haven't forgotten. That ain't gonna happen. As a matter of fact, more people are learning about Waco and remembering as we speak. Than you, ever killed, before. you killed 70 some odd women and children over a crime that there was no evidence having been committed and the only evidence you found was one or two AKs that you probably planted. Yeah, that was worth 70 over, something people. Two AKs. How they killed them? They burned them to death. Good job, ATF. Oh no. Old David Koresh had them start the fires. But, I mean, they shut their power off for how many weeks? So they were running on their kerosene lanterns, and then they ran tanks through the wall to pump them full of CS gas. I don't know. It was a shit show. So it's not like those tanks could have knocked over lanterns to start a fire in their shitty built building. Yeah. Anyway. We know what you did. A fourth inspired principle is in the cluster of vital guarantees of individual rights and specific limits on government authority in the Bill of Rights, adopted by amendment just three years after the Constitution went into force. The Bill of Rights was not new. Here, the insp inspiration 
was in the practical implementation of principles pioneered in England beginning with the Magna Carta. The writers of the con Constitution were familiar with these because some of the, col of the colonial charters had such guarantees. So I read a book a while ago, actually just a few weeks ago, called The Second Amendment Manifesto. I think the title is horrible for that book. They oh, should have yeah. picked something else. I love it. But the information in the book is excellent. Um, and it gives a brief but effective history of how this all went down from a uh, arms ownership standpoint but it breaks down how English I don't know subjects citizens gave gave in to the government why it happened how it happened all of that as far as rights go and then getting away from that was effectively the US Constitution great book everyone should read it yeah. Yeah. The Second Amendment Manifesto. One of the things that we have to admit and that we have to give credit where credit is due is a lot of the inspiration for the Constitution and the Bill of Rights did come from Great Britain a uh, hundred years before. I don't think a lot of us, I don't think a lot of people know that. Um, so we took the principles and the things when they wrested those powers away from the king and we purified them well not we the founders purified them and made it better and greatly expanded upon those things as they were inspired to do but the original groundwork had already been laid a hundred years before in Great Britain and from what I remember they um, in in Eng throughout all of England there's they don't have a written constitution there I think they're one of the nations without a con written constitution because it's an oral constitution but it, they have a constitution but it's a, it's it's one that's like it's the com they call it the common law and it's like people people believe, like i don't know it's it, and that's that's from from what i understand one of the reasons why they've had trouble is because it's not written and there's been politicians who have taken liberties that were right on the edge right on the edge and slowly they have lost th that's one of the what's been a big pain point for them. and now you get arrested for making facebook posts in jolly old england <laughs> teaching your dog we should be more like the europeans people say yeah good job you realize the further we drift away from the constitution the more we regress not progress the uh bill of rights wasn't meant to be exhaustive right an exhaustive list of rights thank goodness they were written down and passed mm -hmm because otherwise they'd have been trampled underfoot already. Well, the Second Amendment, they they weren't even going to include the Second Amendment because they said, well, it's natural. It's This is like yeah. common sense. Well, they weren't going to do the Bill of Rights because it was common sense. Right. Virginia insisted on it. Well, thank goodness something good came out of Virginia. <laughs> we got some good barbecue back there. I wouldn't know. I've never been in there. It is I tasty. Do you have to drive through from up north to get to North Carolina from there? Yeah. We might have made a midnight cannonball run while I was in sub-school. Anyway. But yeah, so if it weren't for Virginia, thank goodness, we have the Bill of Rights. Otherwise, who knows where we would be. The United States probably would have died a long time ago if it weren't for the Bill of Rights. Especially for the second. But, so, I guess we're supposed to care about matters of the royal family especially when it comes to Prince Harry and and what's her what's her face because I keep exactly I only see it because Fox News sends me push updates to my phone and half of them have to do with 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 them I'm like why the hell do I care I haven't cared about the royal family since 1776 did, did but he said recently he says the first amendment is bonkers well I'm sorry I'm Harry I don't give that. a shit what you say he got, he got roasted on all the things I paid attention to oh yeah he says it's bonkers and I was telling my wife about it, and she's like, why? I said, because he comes from a place where the citizens don't get to say what they think. Mm -hmm. And he's part of the monarchy. You know, he couldn't say that if it wasn't for the First Amendment, right? He's a prince. Right. He can say and do what he wants because he's royalty. 
throw him in the ocean. See if it does him any good to be a prince then. <laughs> anyway. I wonder how many of the problems that you've had you've solved by throwing someone in the ocean. No. We did shoot some ashes out of the torpedo tubes once. It, it, was it like on... Uh, and, uh, did you ever make anybody walk the plank like on down periscope? That's, that's what I was imagining. No. <laughs> as accurate as down saying? periscope I mean, is... Like, <laughs> that that didn't no. As what? That was on a, as accurate as down periscope is, as far as the culture of submarines go. What are you doing with that chicken? He's my parrot. <laughs> I don't don't let him fly away. He's is. my dinner. We know you don't know what down periscope Dude, is, that Fred. That movie is awesome. You should watch it. <laughs> is it Lindsey Grammer. Yeah. Love Lindsey Grammer. Anyway. Um. Arr, arr, arr. Yeah. Pirates, there weren't so. any planks to walk. Submariners are just the last of the drunken sailors. That's all. Um, <laughs> should we move on with the Bill of Rights? Yep. Yeah, I'll, I'll go. So we don't deteriorate into drunken sailors? Without a Bill of Rights, America could not have served as the host nation for the restoration of the gospel, which began just three decades later. There was divine inspiration in the original provision that there should be no religious test for public office. But the addition, the addition of the religious freedom and anti-establishment guarantees in the First Amendment was vital. We also see divine inspiration in the First Amendment's freedom of, freedoms of speech and press and in the personal protections in other amendments, such as for pr criminal prosecutions. I thought it was interesting that he added in the criminal prosecutions one because it's one of those things that you don't think about much. It's, you don't think about that being such a, a big deal, but when when the government plays these these games with, oh, we got to change your hearing, you got to change this, got and they, they draw out time or they make it so you don't have enough time to do things and, and they screw you around, and then because they're screwing you around, you don't have a way to win. It's just a way to, like, there there's... There's certain things that that's a it's really um, that's really important. But at the same time, we we don't cut people's hands off for stealing an apple. Oh, Singapore! Singing the Middle East. Oh, so Sing Singapore's got some messed up consequences to basic infractions <laughs> as well. But I mean, that's just a for. For instance. Yeah. Fifth and finally, I see divine inspiration in the vital purpose of the entire Constitution. We are to be governed by law and not by individuals. And our loyalty is to the Constitution and its principles and processes, not to any office holder. In this way, all persons are to be equal before the law. These principles block the autocratic ambitions that have corrupted democracy in some countries. They also mean that none of the three branches of government should be dominant over the others or prevent the others per from performing their proper constitutional functions to check one another. I love that he said that our loyalty is to the Constitution. I like that he specifically stated not to any office holder. Mm-hmm. We're not beholden to politicians. We're beholden to the Constitution and to the law. And not just any not just, not just law. any law that they throw out there willy-nilly. Those laws which are just and righteous and moral. Yes. If they are so, if they don't meet that criteria I'm, I'm you, you have no you have no um for, there's no force in making you follow those laws. It's effectively wrong to be obedient to those laws. Mm -hmm. So I, I've thought about the whole idea of obedience, and and it's it's kind of held as like some kind of I don't know what the word is virtuous. for it. It's virtuous to some people, and and people leave out the part where being obedient to the laws of God is virtuous just being obedient like a good dog is obedient but it doesn't make them virtuous like you, you're just doing something because you're told okay 
Okay, bye to your agency. What was the thing that you posted on on Facebook on your on your little page? Oh, about on backyard barbecue. Yeah, about the uh, the people wearing masks. I will pull it up. It was pretty good. I have a Facebook group. Friends it's about why. It. It's why <laughs> some people are so adamant about keeping it going and still doing it. Like a lot of people got to the point where, I mean, up here, where we live, you know, people weren't wearing masks, and then the governor said you had to, and slowly more and more people started wearing masks. Actually, that wasn't in the barbecue. That was in was on, on my personal page. Personal page. Oh. I let the world see that one. <laughs> but uh, yeah, as it went on and on, people started, you know just doing what they were told because well the governor said so and it's law that's not how law, law works in the united um, states the I'll executive read. doesn't just come down and say this is how it is and you will obey it we don't have kings masks gave meaning to people with meaningless lives people were led to think they were doing something virtuous by wearing a mask all day many don't want the scam to end because it makes people re-examine re -examine the sunk costs and entertain the possibility that it was all for nothing. Is there suffering and virtue? A lot of times, yeah. Is is, is Are you going to look back and feel like an idiot for doing what you did if you were doing something that was truly virtuous? No. Exactly. Nope. But on the same hand, the same there's a flip side or whatever I mean you know it, it to wear a mask it sucks it some people with their jobs and stuff they didn't have a choice so I mean I'm not really talking to them you know to wear a mask you lose your job um, and I, I emphasize for those people I was luckily was not ever in that position but uh, I forgot where I was going you know, wearing the mask, it sucks, and in a lot of ways, yeah, it's uncomfortable, and there's suffer well, there was suffering in it, but it wasn't truly virtuous. In certain instances, it, it, it was necessary, but not necessarily for the reasons that we were sold. The people who are at risk should have worn masks and follow those things. Maybe. But, maybe, if you felt like you were at risk, then, I mean... It's all about individual liberty. If you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. But you don't have the power and you don't have the authority or the morality to force other people to do it. We don't live by force here. You're scared? Okay. And the thing that I kept seeing over the last year and a half has been, well, I have health problems. Well, I'm sorry. You know, and I'm not... You know, I'll, in a lot of instances, yeah, I, I will be as accommodating as I can. But at the end of the day, your health problems are just that, your problem. On not, top of that. not mine. If you, if you want to get into the health problems, if you go back and rethink your decisions on how you treated your body a lot that got you to that health problem, there's a reasonably large percentage of health problems that are your own fault because of the choices you made along the way. I feel like my you're, service. Why, why are you personally attacking us again? My, I'm not. <laughs> my, I'm part of this. <laughs> my service. My service to our country is the reason for a lot of my problems. My my respiratory issues. My leg. Yeah, consequence of my own actions and decisions. I was more referencing the things that are saying. like because you ate at McDonald's every day that all through I your twenties. I know what you're what you were referencing and what you were Not because you got told to go do some stuff that ended up costing you a lot physically. And for mentally. a lie. Okay. For a lie. Yeah. Okay, despite. Despite the divinely inspired principles of the United States Constitution, when exercised by imperfect mortals, their intended effects have not always been achieved. Important subjects of lawmaking, such as some laws governing family relationships, have been taken away, uh, have been taken from the states by the federal government. The First Amendment guarantee of free speech has sometimes been diluted by suppression of unpopular speech. 
The principle of separation of powers has always been under pressure with the ebb and flow of one branch of government exercising or inhibiting the powers delegated to another. I marked that, that entire paragraph. That sounds, the end of that sounds a lot like executive orders or mandates from the governor. Also Law comes from the legislative branch and it is forced by the executive branch. The executive isn't supposed to have really anything to do. They pretty much just sit there and then, like, okay, sign that after it's gone through the legislature into law. Um, the executive really shouldn't have anything to do. I'm impressed with uh, the way he formatted the first sentence of that. Because I, I couldn't have put it that nicely. Despite the divinely Despite inspired the, principles of the United States. When exercised by imperfect mortals, their intended effects have not always been achieved. That's a really nice it's way to put that. I guess that's why he's an apostle. Probably. And I'm an asshole. What? I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I really I really do like that um, he did he did he balanced those two things out. He didn't deteriorate the fact that it's divinely inspired by saying that we've missed the mark. He, he balanced that mm -hmm. out perfectly where he, he, he let you, he let it, he made it clear that, okay, this, just because this is good, doesn't mean all these things that have happened are also good. And, and he, and he helped make, it, it helped distinguish those two. I think he also yeah. acknowledged that there's been progress made along the way. Yeah. And humanity's really slow at making progress. <laughs> well, since the society, since the United States was founded, society has advanced more, uh, you know, as human society has advanced more in the last 250 years than it did in the previous 5,000 years because of freedom. If the United States hadn't become a country, if this hadn't been founded, we would still be living pretty similarly to the way that they did in 1776. Pretty similarly. We might be at the 1830s, but, I mean, the... The United States and the freedoms and the abilities to invest and invent and, and everything led to that 5,000 year leap between 1776 and now. In 250 years, the world moved farther than it had in the previous 5,000 years. I think there's a lot of things that come into that though. I think that the, uh, my, uh, personally, I think a lot of that is from divine province. Mm -hmm. A lot of divine inspiration from mm -hmm. two individuals, and yeah, it needed, I, I, I it, agree. needed it needed that um, that it needed space for freedom. But not all all it, not everything's come f just here in, because of the United States as well. And so it's like I mean, there's, there's but it needed the leaping point. It needed that leaping point. It's definitely it's definitely been a good thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, but but I, I I hesitate taking all the credit. Because I think the credit's got. Yeah. Well, this is his country. This is his choice land that he set apart. I think you two are in violent agreement. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, I agree with you. And I think, I think just as much to give credit to as the Constitution in the United States is the gospel being restored. So, I mean, that's my opinion. And we're in agreement. We have the same opinion, just voiced it differently. Mine's better. <laughs> we're just okay, a um, douchebag. There are, no, there are other threats that undermine the inspira inspired principles of the United States Constitution. The stature of the Constitution is diminished by efforts to substitute current so so societal trends as the reason for its founding instead of liberty and self-government. The authority of the Constitution is trivialized when candidates or officials ignore its principles. The dignity and force of the Constitution is reduced by those who refer to it like a loyalty test or a political slogan instead of its lofty statutes as a source of authorization 
for the limits of, on government authority. This, this, sent, or this, this paragraph, I absolutely loved because y here's what happens. You get people that use like this litmus test. They like, oh, are you on our side or are you not on our side? And it's like, well, do you fly the flag or, oh, do you do this or, oh, do you, you know, they have, there's, 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 you get these people that, that, um, it's, it's, it turns tribal and it turns more of a base society. And he, he explicitly says, if we're using it as a loyalty test, if we're using it as a political slogan, it's diminishing it. Well, it's the same thing as people who go to church and put on the show of they're doing all the right things versus people who are, go who are going to church to make their lives better and to be better people. Exactly. You're, you're checking all the boxes for the world to see instead of using the gospel for what it for what it is and becoming better by it it's, it's the same thing um one of the things that i thought about when we were going through that um is the current societal trends as reasons for its founding um the first thing that i thought of is i don't know if you guys have seen the new recruiting video for the for the army with the girl with the girl the cartoon mm -hmm. did you see it uh, 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 next and she to says the, uh, yeah Russian? yeah oh, man, that's no, why crazy. i said the rest of the world is still training to deploy and defeat their enemies and we're worried about oh, that man, but the you. thing the thing that i thought about when i saw it was she she was saying that she attended pride rallies and all this other stupid shit and saying i like to think that i've been defending freedom all my life no you haven't how are you defending freedom by attending a march or a rally should we treat gay people any differently than we treat, you know, straight people? Or whatever? No. But, I mean, you're not as picked on as you like to say that you are. You used to be. You're not now. And and so that's... that's you're that's saying right. we've made progress as a society over the last 50 to 100 years? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Have you ever clubbed a gay person? No. Have you? Yes. <laughs> What about you? That's a no. I've never, I've never clubbed anybody. Never, never stoned anyone for that. Nope. Nope. I've always treated them about the same as I treated everybody else, like crap. <laughs> well, you I, set a pretty low bar. <laughs> I mean, I'm kind of of the opinion that, like, if you're a cool person that is good at your job, or you know, is have, nice to your neighbor, I have gay friends, then, and I make fun of them for being gay, and they've always laughed. Maybe they go home and cry themselves to sleep at night because of you, Mitch. I doubt it. Because they say mean things to me, too. So, <laughs> But, I mean, that's, that's what I thought about. I mean, the stature of the Constitution is diminished by efforts to substitute current societal trends as the reasons for its founding. Yeah. The United States was not founded for you to be gay. Or transgender, or whatever specific little group or niche you want to fit into because you think you're special well if i'm not mistaken the it was for all of us to be free the constitution was founded for everyone to be free regardless of whatever you what if, whatever, whatever box you put yourself in yeah whatever prescribed box you decide you want to live in so but i mean we're seeing we're seeing it all over the place special interest groups are getting preferential treatment the mayor of Chicago said that she would grant these interviews to anybody that's not white. That's going to be an interesting one to watch over the next several weeks and months. So, I mean, I we're mean, giving people preferential treatment, and that's wrong. Whether you're white, brown, blue, black, who cares? It's wrong. Preferential treatment is wrong based upon race. And we've talked about this before. We're American. You're American or you're not. And that's the only thing that matters. We're all God's children, but here specifically in the United States, we're either all American or we're not. I think that Chicago example is a is an illustration of critical race theory in our country today, which ties into what I think, what I thought of when I when I read that sentence as well, which was the 1619 project, which tried to say that the the United States and the Constitution was based upon slavery and wanting to uphold slavery in the world and and that was the reason and and the 
the force behind our country. So obviously subverting the Constitution. Um, yeah, that is absolutely not correct. And, and of course, <laughs> and, and critical race theory and what the mayor of Chicago is saying is, well, I'm going to flip it on its head and just discriminate the other direction because of the, the belief or the, the theory that, well, if everything's been bad in one way up until now, then I'm going to flip it around providing my own societal justice. We're going to make up for it. It's not your job. Christ will make up for it. And it's not going to happen in this life for any of us. Everybody experiences injustices. Everybody experiences trauma. And we don't, that's not anybody else's job to make up for it. Christ made that difference up and it will all apply in the next life. Granted, not everybody knows that or will believe that, but that's the reality of the matter. It's nobody else's job to administ administer justice other than those who have been appointed to do so. And where did they get the authority? From us. Bringing it back to the truth. No, I thought that that was a perfect example, and you know, everybody talks about how the founders were were slave owners. Well, half, about half of them, half the people at the Constitutional Convention were slave owners. The other half were abolitionists. The founders, like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, they knew that slavery was wrong, and they wanted to abolish it. They had slaves, but they knew that there was no way to get the Southern states involved without allowing slavery. So it, the, the Constitution was built on inspiration and compromise. So like the whole three-fifths compromise, that's exactly what it was. It was a compromise. The northern states, the abolitionist states, actually didn't want to count the slaves in matters of representation because the south, the north wanted more power legislatively, but the, the southern states insisted on them at least being counted for something. So that's where that all came from. Is it wrong? Yeah, I don't think anybody's gonna argue that, but it's been made up for. The justice has been doled out in the 14th Amendment. Section four. Section four. Our belief in divine inspiration gives Latter-day Saints a unique responsibility to uphold and defend the United States Constitution and principles of constitutionalism wherever we live. We should trust in the Lord and be positive about this nation's future. That is one of the one of the best paragraphs in the entire thing. Keep up the good work, Fred. Be positive. <laughs> well, we should as be as it even says it. Latter day Saints have a unique responsibility to Slow uphold down. and defend the United States Constitution. We've been told this since the very beginning of the church. Because it's based on truth, because it's based on God inspiring men. It supports moral agency. And we have... It's one of its primary purposes. As members of the church, we have a better and deeper understanding than most other people do about the importance and the inspiration behind the Constitution. Thus a bigger responsibility. Absolutely. So, I mean, straight. I mean, this isn't the first time we've heard this. We've heard it off and on throughout the entire history of the church. We have a greater responsibility to uphold and de defend it. What else are faithful Latter-day Saints to do? We must pray for the Lord to guide and bless all nations and their leaders. This is part of our article of faith. Being subject to presidents or rulers, of course, poses no obstacle to our opposing individual laws or policies. It does require that we exercise our influence civilly and peacefully within the framework of our constitutions and applicable laws. On contested issues, we should seek to moderate and unify. That's pretty straightforward. We're kind of stuck on the last sentence of that paragraph. Mm -hmm. On contested issues, we should seek to moderate and unify. Some contested issues we absolutely should not. Abortion? Well, you should support what's right. Yeah, but what you should seek to, to moderate, moderate to and right. unify. 
What does it mean to moderate? The moral. What are we moderating? Yes. Because <laughs> moderate means to um, speak back and forth. It means to mm -hmm. have conversation. It means to bring people together and to unify. But like what Miles was saying, we have to we have to unify toward we unify to truth and unify to God, and speak with others. Don't don't stonewall people. Don't be like, oh, if you don't think the way I do, then screw you. No, I know I know that's what you. <laughs> <laughs> what I what I hear moderate to me that means to meet somebody halfway. You think compromise? Yeah. Uh, so there's there's actually because the words are synonymous. Mm, I, I think context is required. There's multiple. True. I think there's multiple True. definitions for the word moderate. Because like moderation in all things, that's again moderate is to have take it within measure, which is the which would be more in line with compromise. But there's also someone who's a moderator. There's someone who's a, who moderates, and they they speak to both parties and bring the parties together. They, they, True. And so I so their their purpose is to kind of remove the heated discussion and get to to the root of sorting out a problem. True. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So I was I was understanding that wrong. Well, I possibly possibly, but I knows? don't know how I don't. There's I, there's a lot of issues that we. And maybe he's using it in multiple multiple meanings, mm -hmm. um, because there's there's some issues that we face that are pretty hotly contested. That yeah, we could totally all just meet in the middle and get together on it and move on. I think for that forward progression, following the principles of the, uh, those five principles, you can, for instance, take for instance uh, the uh, abortion, right? Mm -hmm. If we if we follow the five principles, letting states make their own choices gives more. It lets us stay together in a more of a unified way, but also lets people make meaningful choices, like decide what what is legal locally. Yeah, well, and that's you know the entire premise of the Constitution was for the federal government to be. As small. As small as possible. Mm -hmm. Very limited. And then the states were supposed to decide for themselves what they want to do. Mm -hmm. And then that way, if your state's doing something you don't like, and a lot of things you don't agree with, you can leave. You can go to another state that better emulates your values. And then you can change it to the way it was in the place you were at? You can't go from there. <laughs> you can't go from there to here without making here there. But, I mean, in the circumstances of, like, any of the four of us here, if we move to another state, are we going to take principles of bigger government and more control, or are we going to take principles with us of less government and more individual liberty? Well, I'm pretty sure I know where I'd like to move. And it's because of the way it is there, not because of the way it is here. Uh, Montana or Idaho in a heartbeat. More leaning towards Idaho right now. Montana's a little too blue for my tastes. It's getting more red. It's shifting back. I haven't researched that very much other than I've paid I attention to a handful of things. Think about moving to Montana, right? I'd love to move to Montana. It's wonderful. <laughs> but uh, so I I'm I'm glad that we that we clarified on that and discussed it a little bit further because now after our little it, it, it's, it, there's a, after it's our a little sidebar meaning, huh? Yeah. I I think that he was using it and I with suspect, its multiple meanings depending on the circum to, circumstance. I don't know for sure. But I mean, like we could we could apply that to the Second Amendment too. And the Church doesn't comment on on gun rights. And I would suspect that the Church is actually very pro-gun because that's how we maintain our status of independence. Because without a means to um, actively be able to resist, you're at the whim of, you know, for example, Joe Biden right now, vaxxed or masked. I have my questions about policy in that in the church but true but, i don't know but don't know. they have liability issues that they have to be concerned about as well as true. far as carrying in the church and stuff i'm not going to say whether or not i carry again at church but i mean that in circumstances like that they have liability issues that they do have to worry about this is true which i which i completely understand but I also suspect that up in the vaults they probably have quite an arsenal to dole out. You think if everybody's needed. got an arsenal? 
I do not think everybody has an arsenal. Everybody should have an arsenal. Would you be surprised if you found out that the church had an arsenal of rifles and ammunition to dole out if the time came and it was needed? Would you be surprised? Never would you be surprised. Never thought about this question. I would be a bit surprised. You would? I don't think I would. My, my initial reaction. At least ammunition. We know that we're going to be persecuted again. We also know that we're going to have to defend ourselves again. So, I wouldn't be surprised. That's all I'm saying. They, they do preach pre preparedness. Yeah. There are other duties that are part of upholding the inspired Constitution. Isn't it your we turn? Should... I'm pretty sure I read the last one. Doesn't matter. Keep going. Go. I thought you read the last one, Mitch, with Moderate and Unify. No. I don't Just remember keep going who read. read. Okay, it's fine. There are other duties that Where? are... <laughs> There are other duties that are part um, of upholding the inspired Constitution. We should learn and advocate the inspired principles of the Constitution. We should seek out and, and support wise and good persons who will support those principles in their public actions. We should be knowledgeable citizens who are active in making our influence felt in civic affairs. That means attending city council meetings or, or county mm. meetings state meetings that you're allowed to yeah. well also notice that he said citizens not subjects mm -hmm. and that we should be knowledgeable and that we should learn and advocate inspired principles well. right here he's paralleling dnc 98 where he says we should seek out and support wise and good persons who will support those principles in their public actions he's and if you notice principles is italicized because that's the principles of the Constitution freedom individual liberty self-government limited government and like you said it was an important an important um, diff, uh, differentiation yes I'm saying citizens not subjects anybody else no you want to take this, Mitch? No, it's okay. I don't know where we are at, so... Okay. In the United States and in other democracies, political influence is exercised by running for office, which we encourage by voting, by financial support, by membership and service in political parties, and by ongoing communications to officials, parties, and candidates. To function well, a democracy needs all of these. But a conscientious... A conscientious citizen does not need to provide all of them. I like this a lot. Because that's one of the things that gets discouraging or demoralizing is like, oh, I'm not taking care of this, or oh, I'm not taking care of that, or oh, I'm not... There's always something more you could be doing. And he's basically saying, you don't have to do everything yourself. Just focus on what you... Like, do... Be part of something, but you don't need to do everything. And, and I think that's really important because it's it's easy to get demoralized by the things that you're not doing yet. It's like, oh, I should be doing that, and I'm not. I should be doing that more, and I'm not. And it's like, okay, well, just do what you're doing that's good and, and be part of the good thing. It comes back to that principle of, like, lift where you stand that Oakdorf talks about, where it's like, just do the things that you can take care of and do those. There are many political issues, and no party platform or individual candidate can satisfy all personal preferences. Each citizen must therefore decide which issues are most important to him or her at any particular time, then members should seek inspiration on how to exercise their influence according to their individual priorities. This process will not be easy. It may require changing party support or candidate choices even from election to election. I think that it's notable that he says that it will not be easy. And also, I think what we're doing right now is falls under that. Just to play devil's advocate, um, as far as where he says there are many political issues and no party platform or individual candidate, which I'm going to exclude the individual candidate because everybody has their own personal beliefs and we're never going to align solely with somebody. But as far as no party or platform, if we're to look 
and there's a million parties out there. Are all of them recognized in all 50 states? No. But as far as the teachings and principles that we believe in the church, as far as it goes to the Constitution, the Constitution party aligns almost perfectly for what we believe what you in the almost? church. Almost. Because there are differentiations between some of the things on their policy and things that we believe individually. But what are you laughing at? Why are well, you an idiot? You, you were saying, I'm going to play devil's advocate, so you were going to say like... I oh. don't have the entire platform memorized, <laughs> but... <laughs> because it's like three pages long. That's not very long. <laughs> Shove it. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying, because I shared the platform with you, uh-huh. and you read it. Uh-huh. I don't know if I shared it with you. I don't know if I, I will either. I have not read it. It's good. But, I mean, as far as our I values and probably. principles and, and what we believe in the church, I mean, one of the first things they say in the, in the platform for the Constitution Party is we believe that this is Christ's nation and we need to return it t- to him and his guidance. They also say they speak about abortion and saying that, you know, we don't agree with with um, abortion because of incest or rape because why should an innocent individual be punished for the sins of their father which is another thing that we believe all man is you know is held accountable for his own transgressions not Adam's I butchered that but you know I mean their their taxation their their what they believe in taxation is going back to the original um ways of taxation, collecting it through excise taxes, you know, sales tax, what you pay taxes on what you buy, and, you know, you contribute to the taxes accordingly through what you buy. The more you buy, obviously, the more money you have, so the more you're going to spend, or the less you buy, the less money you have, you know, and so it's a more, it's a more equal way to divvy out taxes. On the Second Amendment, they believe on doing away with all federal regulations on the Second Amendment, which leads to us being more free. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to sway people f- to from one party to the other. I'm just putting the information out there. I know where I fall politically in the political spectrum, and those are the things that I believe. Those are the things that I believe are just moral and right. But I mean, not everybody has those same values principles but I mean for me my absolute red lines in the sand that I will never cross are pro-choice and um, um, limits on the Second Amendment so that means I can't really vote for either party <laughs> I mean the Republicans are are um, not pro-choice the Democrat Party is obviously blatantly 100% pro-choice and that's one of the biggest things that they they go on but I mean the Republicans will cave on the Second Amendment first chance they get Democrats don't agree with it so I mean Republicans are allegedly in alignment with the Second Amendment allegedly <laughs> but I mean allegedly. that politicians are good at telling you what you want to hear and then not doing it yeah, yeah look at Mitt Romney oh mittens but so I mean, I just wanted I just wanted to touch on that. Hey, there's a rabbit. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, he's a cocktail. Damn it! You're lucky. He's just a little guy. I would have smoked him. Ooh. Something's broadside and everything. Dumb bunny. He's not even running. No, oh, he's broadside and everything. That rabbit knows. He's been reading the hunting regulations. Yep. Damn cottontails. Anyway, I just I just wanted to touch on that. If you watch this, if you agree with the things that we say, it, it's it's worth looking into that platform because it aligns aligns with what we what we believe in our principles. It's powerful. Hey, anybody else? Anything? Okay. Such independent actions will sometimes require voters to support candidates or political parties or platforms whose other positions they cannot approve. That is one reason we encourage our members to refrain from judging one another in political matters. 
We should never assert that a faithful Latter-day Saint cannot belong to a particular party or vote for a particular candidate. We teach correct principles and leave our members to choose how to prioritize and apply those principles on the issues presented from time to time. We also insist, and we ask our local leaders to insist, that political choices and affiliations not be the subject of teachings or advocacy in any of our church meetings. I think that goes back to that talk I mentioned of your, you have a brain, use it to choose how to prioritize and apply I the principles we've been taught. I agree, but at the same time I don't, because I believe there's core principles that we as members of the church shouldn't compromise on. But then again... But if that was the case, then there's no political party that we would support. That's true. Probably no candidate, because you don't get to be a political candidate by... They're politicians. They compromise and they lie about everything. Come back. Yeah, so... Well, I mean, it's just one of those things. I agree, but I, I, I don't. This kind of, this kind of goes against what Hiram, Hiram Smith said, who we hold as a prophet seer and revelator, also, of choosing the best candidate possible and the best party possible, off of what's moral, just, and right. Which we should know those things. I think Fred and Mitch need to start running for office. No, I thought about it, and then I decided, you know what, if I had a choice, all the people who've moved into the community in the last five years, I would probably kick them all out if I could. And then I would say nobody else can move here to this county, because we're full. We don't have enough water, and you're probably a shitty driver, so... Such an angry person. I love it. Kind of. Does does that follow these teachings, Mitch? I don't care. I don't care about that. <laughs> what we've been talking about all That's day. Why <laughs> That's why I said I shouldn't. I shouldn't be put in that position. It's another one of your red lines. Exactly. I'd be crossing my own lines and my own beliefs <laughs> out of self. Can you, self- can you ever go anywhere without crossing a red line? You got lots of them. You draw them in a big circle around you. Yeah, and it's hard. I need more Jesus in my life before I could run for office. Well, the first step is acknowledgement. <laughs> What's the second step? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still working on the first one. <laughs> the, church at, um, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will, of course, exercise its right to endorse or oppose specific legislative proposals that we believe will impact the free exercise of religion or essential interests of the church organization interests of church organizations I think this is important that it's in there just like we wish our state would lead out on good laws and and leadership to the rest of the country I I in general wish our church was a little more outspoken and a leader in the Christian community depends on the subject and the issue because not everybody's LDS. Um, like, do you guys remember Prop 2 a couple of years ago? The medical marijuana law? Mm-hmm. And it passed, like, overwhelmingly passed through the election. It was, that's, people were okay with it, people wanted it. And then the church got involved and it changed, and I have no idea where it's at now. But I. I don't really see how that has an impact on the church. Why why is you know medical I mean? marijuana any different than any other well, prescription drug? Yeah. So the, it seems the, like the, you every, understand where everyone's from. everyone's fine with all the other prescription drugs that are Lortab. arguably more, more addictive and more harmful than than a naturally occurring substance than a, than a plant. I mean I, I don't know the effects of it. Like that's not something I'm interested in. But I've also seen enough things to make me. It should also be a viable. Think that if if it's proven to work for certain things, then then why isn't it used? Yeah. And well, Maybe and because it's naturally it, occurring and not created in a lab somewhere. Somewhere. Why was the church so adamant about getting involved and being against it? Well, that I don't know. That's. Maybe that's that was, residuals that was, of the war on drugs might be i don't know i would say if they get involved 
maybe they should at least try and justify their position and, and teach people why they are doing what they're yeah. doing. I think yeah. that's reasonable. I, 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 I wish to understand why, yeah. not just we're against this. Okay, why are you against it? Yeah, absolutely, I agree. You know, all things on the earth were put here for our benefit to use for, you know, whatever. For their, for their purpose. Yeah. Whatever that yeah. purpose is, you and know, I'd like some understanding. understanding. Where I saw a conflict of interest was where where the church was um, invested heavily with pharmaceutical companies. And so, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not claiming to know. I would just like further clarification as to why, why, you know. But another thing that we see, at least here in Utah, is when it comes to issues like that, members ask, well, how should I vote on this? Instead of coming to a conclusion on their own, they'll ask, yeah. they'll ask, they you know, go study it out. the brethren or their bishop or stake president or whoever, how should I feel or how should I vote about this? And they're not even going to study it out necessarily. And they're they're going to give say, you their stance on it that yeah. they are at at that point in time. Pot is bad. Worse than lower tab? Yeah. Or oxycodone? Well, is pot bad because of the propaganda we've been seeing about it for the last... 40 years in this country or is is it bad i just wish for further clarification like you said i i believe that we that's something that we deserve and you know the like like we've said or at least i've said before the church and the teachings and the principles are correct but it's still led by men and we're all fallen and opinions do get in the way of certain things for everybody Regardless of whether you're Joe Schmo like us or an apostle, we would like to think and believe that they that they don't. But human nature is human nature, and will always be there. None of us are going to get it right. A lot of it, to me, comes down to this um, principle of agency. Still, a lot of it is that principle of agency. It's like we we. I like how in here he he encourages us to be politically active and and be, be let our voices be heard he also but encourages us to study and learn yeah and form informed opinions yeah and one of the things that um one of the things that uh he i guess in that last section though is like he does say that just because we're encouraged to learn for ourselves doesn't mean that the church isn't going to step say that they're against something at some point and mm -hmm. I'm thinking of Prop 8 was a big one back in California when yeah, I was growing up. Yeah, I remember that, that one. Was, um, that was on about abortion, I believe. It was abortion or gay rights, one of the two. One of the two. And and it was a big there was a big vote in California for Prop 8. And it was um, and the church came out heavily and said, no, we're against this. And mm -hmm. and it was like, I was I was glad to see that. And, and I don't remember. I was young. I was only like 11. But um, I remember... So I, I guess I wasn't at the time. I didn't care, but thinking back, I was like, I, I like, I, I do like that direction, coupled with the teaching and with the justification, like you had mentioned, of like, okay, well, this is our, this is the eternal principle that we believe in. So this naturally goes against what we believe in. Mm -hmm. So we are against this, and we encourage you to be against it. See, and that's one of those things where um, their position made sense. It needed no further clarification because it was a. Um, it had to do with matters of the family and we know where the church falls in matters of the family and that's where we should all believe because whatever it was, whether it were abortion or gay rights, it, it has an impact on the family unit mm -hmm. and we expect the church to stand up and you know, proclaim, yeah, proclaim to the world that we defend the family and traditional family values mm -hmm. and I don't, I, 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 don't, I don't disagree with him when he says the church is going to exercise its right to endorse or oppose specific legislative proposals that we believe will impact the free exercise of religion or the essential interests of the church organizations. I don't have a problem with that. I agree. You're always going to do what's best for, your, for yourself. And for the most part, when the church comes out and says this is what's for the best, for the most part, I'm going to agree. Because, I mean, they receive more inspiration than I do. For the most part, I mean, depending on certain things, but 
depends on the subject and its direct application to you. I mean, exactly. you're going to get more inspiration on your family's individual needs than than they are, than your church leaders are. Yeah, yeah. So it's all it's all subjective, but you know, like I said, with the prop two thing, I just wish we they would have given us more information as to why they were against it, because it seems like a naturally occurring substance is better than you know something engineered in a lab. A synthetic yeah. painkiller or whatever other use. One of the things that I get um, really leery of or really uh, frustrated with is you get busybodies, people who um, are. Parents. <laughs> well, I'm thinking of like uh, specifically people who, <laughs> when when you work for the church or work in the church, and it's like you the, it, it, you can you can justify wanting to make sure that all like you you view the the funds that you're working with and that kind of stuff is really um they're they are sacred and you should view them that way but sometimes you view them that way and it's like okay so we need to get the best deal on this possible so and then it it leads you it leads you into like screwing someone over it's like because you want to get a good deal and treat the funds sacredly yeah but that's not being honest in your dealings with your fellow man i know i know that's what that's what i'm that's what i'm referring to is like it's that that's that's where what you're saying mitch with prop two or whatever i i could see something where that's i can see stuff where it's like that could be just someone an individual making a bad choice Mm -hmm. and and as as an organization, the church it's full of people. You know, we're yeah. we're we're truly the best that we can. Exactly. So I, I I I'm willing to give the church as an organization the benefit of the doubt because I know that we're we're doing the best that we can. And that always comes back to though, don't be blind, you know, be we need to hold ourselves to the best standard that we possibly can and we mm-hmm. need to speak truth however we can. Yeah. Well a simple paragraph statement would would well and clarify and, things immensely there in all yeah. in all fairness they they may have said why they may have released a statement it's been a few years so I don't remember I don't remember but I mean it's it's just one example of several as we know the, the church is very active in our state politics and legislature and I don't want to say lobbying but because they don't really need to <laughs> but I mean, it's it's just one of those one of those things that if they're going to come out and say and make a statement for or against, I think there needs to be more available information, not just to the general public, but to us as members as to why. I I think that's fair. Because God's not going to hide stuff from us. Well, you know what I mean. Without good reason. Yeah. <laughs> I think that, that um, he doesn't trust you. <laughs> Mitch can't be trusted. We know that. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> That's, That's probably fair. good on him. <laughs> uh, Agreed. The more transparency, the better. In all things, I think. I was gonna say, oh, even with like sometimes, sometimes, and I'm I'm thinking in the household, like with my kids and stuff. Sometimes there are certain times where I make a decision, and they're like, why, 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 and and at points. I don't have a reason other than it felt right. Like, it's like, you know, honestly, I don't know why, but I feel like I should make this decision, and that's what I'm going to do. And that even stating that with my kids, I've noticed that they'll be like, okay, I trust your, I trust your, your, the feeling you got too. Ha, fools. And it's just like, it's, it, it, sometimes it's hard to make statements like that when you go through like a PR office or you go through like, you know, it's, it's hard to do things that are, that are, um, in big organizations like that, because the, it's always going to be taken at the very worst possible denominator. It's going to it's going to be looked at in the worst possible light. But I, I think that that there it, there's an integrity that has to requires that you don't care, and it requires mm-hmm. that you, you do what's right regardless of the the bad consequences. Yeah, like you said, it's integrity. You speak the truth, and the truth sells itself. I mean, the church isn't any stranger to losing members over women not holding the priesthood and, and gay rights stuff in in the recent past and even up until now. I think we all know people who've left over those issues. But, uh, you know, ultimately those are the stance and they made it clear and as to why. So... 
and they didn't always make it clear. Like if even things like with blacks in the priesthood and stuff like that, it's not always been clear. And sometimes, yeah. sometimes that is. I think it's also required of us too, is to go yeah. without knowing. Possible, yeah. It's but a fine. It's a, a hard, that's it's a, a fine. It's a line. It's a fine line to, you know. Anyway, it's Ben's turn. Last paragraph. I testify of the divinely inspired Constitution of the United States and pray that we, who recognize the divine being who inspired it, will always uphold and defend its great principles. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Not my testimony, his. <laughs> I mean, I'd, I'd probably claim that one. Yeah. I could second it though. <laughs> That's why we say amen. I, I just didn't want to. Or a women. I just didn't want to <laughs> plagiarize. Yeah. You, you know. A men and a women. What? That's that's of... numerically incorrect. <laughs> a implies one. Women impro- implies multiple. Well, a a man is you know affirmation or I agree. You know, that's, that's know the meaning of the word. It has nothing but to do with gender. With men and women. A men, a women. It's correct for both parts. <laughs> um, so one of the things that I was going to say though is when when you build the reality that you live in around principle it allows you to take those principles and apply them to the current situation it allows you to um to abstract away the core uh because it's a principle it lets you apply it to what is currently relevant and that's something that i think that's i loved how we went into five different principles and basically that's that's what we need that's the moderation Sure. Bringing together people upon principles. Amen. Well, thanks everybody. That was Elders Rising. 23? I think it's 23, yeah.